Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Okay, um, so I'm heading over. So you're, you're mostly free to jump between, yeah, watching and enjoying the show and taking some notes and comments and in the Google Doc. So I'm switching to presenters mode. Um, welcome everyone. I'm presenting today a recent um, paper that we've published with um, pre-peer review, which now has received two peer reviews on F1000, um, which you can also access by clicking on this link. Oh, you can also share the slides maybe. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll drop them in the chat also later. Um, so you can access the, the, the manuscript itself and it's basically the discussion around our results and recommendations. Um, the topic is the varying openness of digital open science tools. Um, the project um, was initiated by Louise Besoldenhout um, sorry for pronouncing. I, I keep struggling with the pronunciation sometimes. Um, so, yeah. So um, she can, unfortunately cannot be here, but um, she um, sends her her greetings and yeah. Also, um, we're looking very much forward to your feedback and your comments and your suggestions on how we can move further with this. Um, so the outline of this presentation is also, we had the, the opportunity to, um, to present this already with the Open Cider community, which um, Sarah, who's here with us now, is the founder and curator of. Um, and yeah, maybe after the presentation, you can also introduce Open Cider a little bit and um, we can reflect on the discussions we had as compared to the discussion we're having here. Um, okay, so the outline of this talk is first we give a little introduction about what we understand as DOSTs, like digital open science tools. Sorry, classic. Um, what well, is uh, the challenge, the problem that we've identified, um, meaning the key restrictions to unlimited openness as we envision open science or digital open science tools to be able to provide. Um, we, we share with you our data set and then the mapping that um, can come out of that and what else we can do with the data set. And yeah, basically presenting the findings, what are the limitations to an unlimited digital comments of digital tools for open science. And of course, um, good discussion amongst us and yeah, Q&A. Um, yeah, this um, basically, uh, Open science as we understand it, and also I think many of us here in this run can subscribe to, um, where open science encompasses a collection of activities, principles, and tools oriented at making scientific research accessible to all levels of society, proposed to increase transparency, efficiency in research workflows and scholarly publish publishing possibly around the world. Um, and this is basically what we often assume is already happening what we are pointing out here is like where it's still not happening, but we have a uh, not, we have the opportunity to make it happen by making sure that the current limitations and bottlenecks can be worked through, and this is basically what we propose. And then all the the things in the box that we are all familiar with. So these are the principles of open science. What comes into play? There's also open hardware, open source, open access, open data. We're all familiar with that. Um, <coughs> So the open science ecosystem has, like the way we argue in, in the paper is that, of course, everything undergoes an, uh, an evolutionary process. And it's not that we're critiquing that things are the way they are. And what we also show is that most of the tools we're using here originate and still continue to be based in the United States and the UK and Western Europe. Um, we're just highlighting what are the challenges for researchers in other parts of the world and then how, and making suggestions and also want to continue the discussion with all the stakeholders involved in how can we make it work for everyone. Um, of course, we understand that digital tools are ubiquitous, a uh, ubiquitous part of open science, or is this really the case? Is everybody in compliance with that um, statement? Um, and um, yeah, online applications assist researchers to share and collaborate. It has enabled a lot of things and a lot of communities also to start participating. So yes, the enabling moment is there and we suggesting can still be increased. Uh, many of the tools have changed the way that research is being done. I think we all have experience and lived through that and also pushing like many of the actors also in this round. Um, 
Yeah, what we're seeing and want to raise awareness to is that there's a lack of critical evaluations and assessments of like, I mean, our lack of, our, there can be more of rather. Um, so basically much of the work that, or the tools we've looked at um, is basically a set of tools that also JRUS, the JRUS community has compiled. And then also Bianca and Jerome have compiled in, um, in the 2016 initiative and one-on-one -on -one innovations or project rather. And we are, very, well, of course, we know that, um, so we have looked at 242 of these tools and we chose tools that in, according to our horizon, and we also have a disclaimer in the paper for that, um, that we know of, of course, like from the research discipline that Louise and I come from, from also a list of tools that are proposed in JRUST and the one-on-one -on -one innovations um, across the research workflow. And we wanted to focus on tools that we, as much as we are aware of, have been designed for and are mostly used um, for, so irrespective if they have originally been designed for open science practices, but the communities embrace them as such. So that's basically how we shortlisted them um, 242. And of course, the list is not exhaustive. Um, but then this, the questions that we ask to each of these tools is, what is the underlying value system? What are the financial models that are sustaining the tool and their development and their evolution? Um, what are language choices? Um, and what are geographical locations for each of these tools, which might, um, which all have consequences and what are the user communities? How diverse are user communities? How open are the tools to user communities in different parts of the world? Um, so yeah, basically, um, again, this is a list of aspects that we also discuss in the paper and um, this um, can also serve as discussion ground and to ask those who actively develop tools if these are things that you have also the capacity. So, so don't see this as an accusation of this needs, like why you're not doing this, rather can we create capacity for addressing all of these concerns that, that, we, that we have and is this being shared among, across the community? So the evolution of, of digital open science tools um, is highly diverse and variable um, and there's diversity in structure, um, organizations, um, like often we have a case where one researcher sees a gap and then starts a, uh, an organization of some sort and, and builds a community around that gap and develops a tool to, to fill the gap. And, <clears throat> and then like sooner or later, you will come to the question that, okay, we need funding to, to make that happen, to actually serve the community, like not only now and tomorrow, but in the middle and long term. Um, and there's different funding models and, and yeah, as, as I also already said in the previous slide, so, Aspects again are also geographic location, language, recruitment strategies to build community. So who are you reaching out to to build your community? And for users and also supporters of the tools and to test the tools. And yeah, so aspects of scope, is it disciplinary or more regional, region oriented? Um, and how specific if disciplinary or what aspect of the research workflow is being addressed? And what are the, what is the purpose um, of the tool? What is it trying to fix, or what is it trying to fill in a gap as a gap? And like, is there an, like is there an idealistic um, view behind it, or is it purely pragmatic? Often it's a mix of both. And is it user driven, or um, yeah, rather top down that the funder thinks, oh, we need this in this way, we put money on it and have it developed and then there might be more or less communication with the user group and the developers. Um, and then power dynamics. So there's different power dyna dynamics always in different projects and initiatives, also for tool development, who is giving money for tool development, for what reason, what are the strings attached? Are there any strings attached? Like yesterday in a discussion there, somebody said like there's always strings attached with funding and, and investment. 
Um, so yeah, what are these strings and why? And, <coughs> and does it then still serve the community? Um, so key questions we're asking, what is the impact of a small number of countries dominating DOS design and deployment? Do heterogeneities in values, funding, and stakeholders that influence tool design and development and interconnection affect the openness of the DOS ecosystem? And then third, um, how, if at all, are external power dynamics and influences um, recognized and addressed in the DOS ecosystem? I think we all are aware of power dynamics, but can we also kind of, <laughs> Um, can we can we influence them back? Like, do we have a say in this as tool designers or as a user community? Like, can we balance that power dynamic in a way? Um, <clears throat> and who are the powers that that are moving things around? Okay, so this is basically a screenshot of the actual data set. Um, I think this is also a good time to um, make a quick jump from presenters mode, oh, it's already open, so into the data set. So here you see the, the 242 tools that we've listed and then categorized mostly aligned with the 101 Innovations Initiative. Um, so we designed workflow steps. We also had brief conversations as we um, worked through this database with Bianca and Jerome um, on like, because for some tools it's obvious that there's more one more than one workflow step um, that's being addressed and then you have to choose for one um, and making the data set work <laughs> or can you also list two? Um, and then how do you categorize or which one do you prioritize? And that's not, not always as trivial to answer. Um, the open science category that's being um, addressed by the tools, open science, open data, open hardware, mostly not, but open source, um, et cetera. Um, who is the host organization? Is there a host organization or is it owned by the community? Basically self-hosted by the founder of the tool um, or is there an institution or government behind? Um, is it relying on other infrastructure? And in most tools, we found that this is actually GitHub. And what does that mean for usage and um, user usability access for researchers in certain parts of the world? Um, we provide um, links to the websites of the tool. <coughs> um, like in most cases, also short descriptions, basically the self-description of the tool, the location um, of the tool, and we've, we've tried and clustered that. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, then funding sources. Um, yeah, and I mean, we, we of course working with, like what, those of you who have worked with databases before. At some point, you have to cluster to make the data set be workable. So we decided for certain clusters of grant versus institutional funding versus various and mixed grants to varying degrees. Of course, there's variations and all of that. I think I, oh, so maybe I need to kind of do, do some ceasefire cease um, mitigation. Okay, is there a fee um, implied or is it free to use? Um, yeah, so these kinds of questions. Yeah, like you will have the link to the Google Doc after I end the presentation. I'll share the links so you can scroll through yourself. Okay, back to the presentation. So then this is also like the table that we designed for the paper. Um, do I need to, I think I just stay in, in this mode now. Um, so not to go through all of these, um, but to pick three. So um, learning from the attributes. Um, so recruitment of user community marketing, the, the elements that are that we see are, are part of that activity as word of mouth or the variations that come with them. Word of mouth, advertising, sponsorship, mandated by funder, institution. So you know, it can go either or, usually it's a mix of all of them, depending on if there's already funding in place or not, um, how commu user communities are being recruited. And then what is like, depending on how that goes for which tool has an impact on how the user community is then being set up, how diverse it is, how in, like 
proactively inclusive of for also tech development by users in like across the world or to what degree um, and what percentage as global representation. Another aspect is integration with other tools can be intentional or um, needs based so that you have to use GitHub because ABC and whatever the community decides. Um, and that then also has consequences on the interoperability of the tool. And then obviously for the host, which host are you choosing or where is the host based? Um, is there like how big of an organization is the host? Um, what is the host country? Uh, may or may not have consequences again for, for the user community or for some for, for a fraction of the user community. And how inclusive do we want to be? How inclusive can we be based on political circumstances? Okay. So <clears throat> all of this also trend um, reflects into a map. And um, so these are screenshots from Kumo.io, which is a data visualization tool. So here we can cluster by workflow step by host location and um, so clustering overview by host institution for the tool. So yeah, so this is basically clusters for basically GitHub and other, yeah, and other. So you see that the clusters are very few, which can be alarming or not. It's just something that we raise awareness to and like, so let's be aware of this is happening. So, and this has consequences on, on user usability. So basically the finding surprising or not surprising, I think for most of us it's not surprising and most digital tools we use for open science in a Western driven context is, are being developed in the United States. And like without um, critiquing that negatively or positively, it's just a fact um, for digital tools that we have researched and also other communities have researched and put together. Um, and then um, others are being developed or have originated in the European Union and the United Kingdom. Um, and then there's two tools that are registered in both the US and the UK. And then others um, are basically the rest of the world and basically also a handful of countries. So other, others um, include Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Colombia, Mexico, South Africa, Switzerland. Um, we, well, there's also China, there's also Russia. Talking to colleagues, um, they said, well, there's probably also digital tools that people use there. Um, but I mean, we're looking at a global community, right? And those tools are then also, again, region specific. And, how, and they also have language barriers. And if we assume that English is a lingua franca for science, then we rely on mostly English speaking tool or English language supporting tools. Um, yeah, or, or not. I mean, this is also to debate. It's not that we have a final answer for this. It's just to explain how the numbers come together. And yes, we thought about also China and Russia and other places where we didn't have access to their digital ecosystem at the time. Whoever has in this room, please share with us and we can make this more diverse as a data set. So findings also for funding models and <clears throat> Again, of course, um, for mix, this is very vari variable. Um, um, for mix model, I think this is also what most communities prefer, not to be dependent on one investor, or one donor, or one institution to keep it going, but to have like, a, yeah, a mixed approach. Um, yeah. And, and but for, for some, there's also a commercial approach. So, so you charge uh, a certain user group, a certain amount or, or the libraries or whatever. And yeah, so the fact is we have to eat as two developers. So somebody needs to pay the price for HR and tech development and hosting. And who, who is this? And this is again, not to critique, but just to put them like to map it out. Like this is what we see for this data set, not exclusively. Okay, and then another finding, and I'm very glad that we have some of um, the representatives also in this um, discussion round, is you find that some tools operate across the research workflow. And that is, and that is basically for, well, GitHub, depending on how you want to, if you want to see GitHub as a tool per se, or, yeah, or an infrastructure provider, it's probably both. Um, you see that it's like from our data set that has quite the, the biggest um, kind of 
support for the, for the most variety of, of the most the highest number of tools uh, placed in GitHub. The Center for Open Science um, has, uh, yeah, and we can also look into data set what's behind that. So it has a, developed a list of tools and, and workflow steps or digital approaches for various aspects of the work research workflow, digital science, of course, of course, pictures in Kira and also others that we are all very much aware of. Elsevier is also looking to cover the research workflow. Wikimedia, we had a presentation with Andy Mitchell yesterday. Um, so that's an option. Our research um, with Jason and Heather um, have five tools or five, work four workflow steps of five tools that they um, offer the community, Science Open, um, <clears throat> and Public Knowledge Project. Yeah, I mean, not, not throughout the workflow, but you get the idea. So, so this is also a dynamic or an evolution that we see. So many of the tool providers have evolved into covering or to, in designing tools that help us to cover the whole research workflow. And that's great in itself, and it's also good that we have options. And um, and I think a question that we want to ask here is like, is this as we as we see this unfold, how can we make this work for um, the global community, and how can we inform users um, and not not to end up in competition, but to to make these organizations and tools be complementary to each other, and also basically specify to user groups which tool is good for what research question, and I. I personally think that it shouldn't be a matter of, oh, digital science is good for earth sciences or something. So it shouldn't be a question of um, which discipline you work in or which region and what you work in, but rather project-based. So which tool makes most use um, for which kind of project? And then the project leads or the project teams can decide, okay, this tool is most feasible for us because ABC, but how can we help users to decide for that? Okay. Um, I'm also getting excited. Is this enough food for discussion? Um, other, another table also in the paper is, well, this is actually a crucial aspect. So here's where it gets tricky for some people, not most, but uh, some people in certain parts of the world, the terms and conditions under which digital tools, tools can be used. And we have here outlined, and again, not to critique or accuse, but to highlight the national and uh, the geographic and the political um, <clears throat> constituencies and, and situations and, and power dynamics that, that are beyond our reach as scientists that do have a real life consequence for, for researchers in certain parts of the world. So both GitHub and the Center for Open Science operate out of the United States. And as such, they have to Nigh by legislature, um, as, a, as I understand. And this is basically more Louise's expertise with sanctions and consequences for certain countries and their academic um, activities. But uh, I think by national legislature, you have to exclude researchers from certain countries from using your system. Otherwise, you, you commit a crime in your own country. Um, and this is basically. Yeah, depriving academic freedom, right? As we want to live it, as we understand it. So we wanted to also highlight that. And then as a global research community, should we put ourselves above national legislature or can we find workarounds for, for our colleagues in Iran, in, in Sudan, in Crimea, like wherever? So how can we um, still work with them and what to, like what, Process can we put into place to make the tools to work for them, and and so for us to be uh, to be able to collaborate. <clears throat> um, yeah, so there is unequal levels of openness in the digital tool ecosystem, is a fact, and I think we all knew that before. And with with this kind of ass assessment, we just want to kind of look at some of these, and again, it's certainly not exhaustive. I want to kind of have a debate and um, on a debate, yeah, like a constructive discussion and how we can work around this. <clears throat> okay, so enough of critiquing, but basically a heterogeneity of the actors. So like we, we also want to turn this in a more like from a, that's a challenge and let's now think solution oriented and positive out of here. Um, 
but let's analyze the situation and then what are the opportunities and how can we move forward from here. So I'm, I'm flipping through these slides and we can come back to this as, as we discuss. Um, uh, another thing that we wanted to raise is also, let's think about open science and digital tools for open science also as responsible research and innovation. And there's a huge opportunity here to, um, to, to kind of drive economies, um, to, to balance imbalances or to balance out imbalances that exist economically and to, um, yeah, to allow participation on a global level. So yeah, and so of course, what open science surely enables is transparency and reproducibility, which then again can drive also innovation in on a global scale and also on a regional and national scale. Um, yeah, and how can this can yeah how can we how can we bring together? Like yesterday, were also discussions and sessions that I attended. Like um, let's also look at the opportunities that come with bringing sectors together. We shouldn't see for-profit as evil um, because we assume it's not value-driven, but I mean, for-profit um, funding models um, are guarantee, for, or not a guarantee, but I kind of improve the possibility for sustainability of a tool. Um, so to think about, and this is also what I personally had to relearn and unlearn and, and learn anew, um, because I'm very much value driven and most of us in the open science movement, I think also are, and what are our values and how can we ensure we, we um, kind of live those values as a community. And for that, we need money on the table and we need to pay fees and we need to pay salaries. So, yeah. So, so again, like personally, I would, I would say a mixed approach is always good and how much of which is healthy or what is, yeah, okay, let's, let's leave it there. I'm getting <laughs> too, um, too much uh, you know, back and forth. Um, the DOS committee has the history, expertise, and those perspectives to address these issues. And yeah, basically, again, what we're asking here is um, how they or we guide and adapt the ecosystem that is rapidly changing. And it is very rapidly changing. I mean, there was also a comparison, where was JROS two years ago, four years ago, and, and today. Um, so yeah, I think I would want to end it here. I want to also highlight, and we can also share this in the chat, so we had also an interview with ZBW Media Talk, where, you, where we explained a little bit further beyond the paper, our thoughts and ideas behind. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and now I, I hand over, is it Bianca? Who, like, how can we move from here? So we have, I think, maybe 10, 15 minutes to Q&A. Yeah, you even have 24 minutes. Oh, okay, great. I wasn't sure. <laughs> no, we so, really have to, until the top of the hour. Great, okay, perfect. Oh, I see. No, this is our chat or is this the general chat? No, this is our chat. Okay. Yeah. Maybe uh, if someone has questions mm -hmm. and any comments, they can bring them to the floor or add them to the Google Doc. Any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions coming in on the Google Doc. Mm -hmm. Oh. Not necessarily a question, I just put in as a resource, Joe, you mentioned uh, you also wanted to look beyond the, the tools that you know, or the English language tools, to tools from, from other regions and other language areas. We did do that to some extent in our survey, where we asked about tools in Spanish, French, Russian, Chinese and Japanese language areas, and also asked participants to, to suggest tools that they use. So those might be a source also that you could use for that as a, as a mm -hmm. start. Cool. Yeah, great. Thank you. Now, where is it? I put it in the document. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Google Doc uh, yeah. at the end. Sure. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. If you go to Q&A section. There mm -hmm. we go. Yeah. Oh, OK. Great. Thanks. OK. You actually added it there. And I see there's, there is a question uh, for 
the person who added this, would you like to vocalize it or would you like me to? Oh, Nicholas, would you like to vocalize it and bring it up? No, it, it's, it's so. Um, I always wonder about this, and um, it would be very good to hear, I think, in, in this group, at least some, some of the hindrances, because there are, there, there, there are frictions, there are circumstances, there are causes um, that lead to you know, less uptake um, of open science or open scholarship tools than I think we would sort of collectively and individually like to see um, in various African countries. And I'm just wondering if we could have a brief look at what those hindrances are. I mean, you've explained some of that, but quite concrete. Um, Um, I'm not sure where you're heading. So, I mean, connectivity is an issue also that we discuss and that we mentioned strongly in the paper, mm -hmm. which was often assumed, of course, we have to work digitally, but can we also find hybrid solutions to enable researchers who do have to deal with connectivity issues to work, uh, with, work with, I, like ICT infrastructure with laptops and, and mobile devices, but not assume that everybody can be connected 24 seven as we in, have in actually very few laboratories. Um, well, relatively, but not, not very few, but you know. So as, like these, looking at these realities of researchers and under-resourced um, research institutions and universities is, is basically also a good starting point. And I mean, the technology is here. We have, there is ways to buffer information to, to kind of, you know, write or, or feed into information into databases that can be pushed online into the cloud once you have um, internet. That's one way, basically. Were you thinking of something else? And then with repositories, another thing which I'm not sure to what degree we mentioned, but ownership for me personally and for us as Epic Archive is also important. So where is the data being archived? We do have servers in, like there's there's kind of nodes for us, or basically these this giant servers I'm talking about in Frankfurt, Germany, and the Boston, United States, I think in the US there's like several. Um, but then those countries also own data from other parts of the world, which can be a political, like, no-go. Like, also for the European Union, it was, like, in, in my research context, like, it was clear that we cannot use American tools for, not even Skype, for communicating because, um, yeah, uh, uh, the work might be patentable or, you know, that don't, you don't want to be scoops or whatever. So there is also competition on national scale, but um, due to the fact that there is no strong server capacity in the global south, automatically leads to the fact that if they share their data digitally, it has to be stored outside of the continent, like in Africa's case. And that's a problem. And why would they do that? So of course they don't participate. Um, from a governmental level, of course, the individual research, researchers might think otherwise, but yeah. these are just two things that come to mind. Thank you. Why is my screen yellow now? Yeah. Um, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why this is happening. Um, maybe I should unshare, but I can't even use the button anymore. Okay, other questions? Um, or comments? Like, is this something I, that you've already thought through and, and kind of addressed in your. Okay, I, I have a question. I was actually in the process of typing it out, but I can just uh, vocalize it. So, in terms of infrastructure, how about in the continent? How about working closely with the NRENs, especially the ones that manage the infrastructure for at least the academic institutions in the respective countries as a starting point of maybe, maybe hosting services because their work is to provide uh, 
internet infrastructure to support whatever resources that the universities might need, even the research institutions in the respective countries in the continent. When I say the continent, I mean Africa. So like Tenet, Kenet in, in Kenya, has that been considered? I mean, who are you asking for Africa? Akavias would actively do that um, for tool development. I don't know. Like this is what That's what I'm asking for the tool development, not for Africa Archive, for the tool development as, as, a, as a possibility to, to look at how you could work with, the, with, the, with them. Bearing in mind, they, we, we are very cognizant of the, the infrastructural challenges, but the NRENs are available to offer the support, at least as a starting point, if you're, if you're targeting the academic institutions. How does that sound? For me? Yes, Joe. Uh, so, so yeah, I think I think in most cases also a question of that. I mean, again, is the capacity there in tool development to think and really on a global scale, and then who can you reach out to to make that happen? That inclusive design process. Um, I think we can all agree that this this or is it like should we have a vote? Like, do we all want to? have a creative or an, uh, a globally inclusive design process for digital tools for open science or is it more feasible and more efficient to keep it in the western sphere and deliver to the rest of the world as it currently happens i mean and again no accusation it's it's it is quite functional so far it's just like in un unknowingly in many cases excluding many people um Uh, yeah, I don't know, but I, I think the, the challenge for to develop is from what I can see, but maybe Eric can, if you could say a few words on this, is that you wouldn't know where to start because it's like also for us who've worked in the African context for two and a half years, it's, it's, we're still learning like every day and, and very basic things like who's responsible for what, what is the capacity, who, who can talk on behalf, how can we move from here? Um, so it's, I'm not saying like we're not assuming it's easy, um, but but there is also stakeholder analyses, and you can recruit also key organizations like I don't know starting with the World Bank, the African Union, and, and the African side of things. But but is the capacity there for for under resourced developer teams? Like that's another question. And how can we bridge that? Eric, do you wanna share? Yeah, I mean, I think there's <clears throat> there's a line there where is there a point where you can repurpose tools that are built, not recreating the wheel, but still within a context that is owned by you know your region and your stakeholder? Um, is that something that can be you know locally stored and and managed uh, and facilitated and cultivated. Uh, I think so, but you know, that's uh, something that each region sort of has its own uh, you know, internal conversation to, to determine if that's the right approach for them. Um, and we see that in, in regions you know, around the world with varying degrees of, uh, of approaches on their part in terms of using established services and tools as you documented there. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's certainly a, a possibility for having a, having something in the middle there where it doesn't have to be either extreme uh, in the margins. Mm. Yeah, Th yeah, thank you. Um, Umberto, would you, <laughs> sorry, um, would you mind sharing your experience from um, uh, Umberto, can you hear us? Would you, like, sorry for calling our buzzers. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm uh, having some troubles with my internet connection. Could you please repeat the question, though? Oh, yeah. So basically, what we're trying to um, kind of to, to, to have different perspectives, just express how easy or how, how feasible it is to make inclusive tool development a reality, even for small teams. Um, like how easy is it for you to basically exchange with 
the tools that you use in your community and your regional context? Um, are you, did you figure that I'd rather develop my own tools and we have tools here in Latin America that work fine for us? But, and how can you plug into the Western context system to make things work for the researchers? It's a fantastic question and uh, I, I do not know uh, the answer. It's, in my personal experience, I, I have uh, worn uh, different hats my usual hats, it's a virologist and, and I work with plant pathology and sometimes I feel the need to get into some specifics about uh, trying to share my information in, at the regional level and uh, beyond the global conversation, which is science. And in, in that specific occasion is where I, I try to find new ways to, try to interact uh, the, with uh, more people and be more inclusive and equitative. And it has been uh, like a learning experience in trying to interact with people who knows how to do things. Because I, I ignore how to program, I ignore how to make things. So it's, it's about uh, trying to, to speak with, uh, with persons who are able to do, to do stuff. Uh, you may have uh, many ideas, but, uh, but if you lack the, 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 the skills, it's very difficult. So I, I can say to be in a little bit short, it's like I, 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 I try to reach out and ask for help and, uh, and try to learn from people who, who have been in, in this field for so much time and, and try to reach out and say, hey, this is what I cannot do. Are you able to do this stuff? It's, it's, that's only how I experience things. Mm. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. I also just shared the data set for, sorry for being so late with this, but yeah, you can um, skim through it and, and also leave comments if you wish. Um, uh, also, if you have suggestions, you can leave it in the Google Doc or the spreadsheet as a comment, um, what we should add and who we can reach out to to add um, more. Um, Peter, would you mind to, because open knowledge maps also early on, so like I think since the beginning, you, you had language diversity on your radar and you implemented it from the upfront, um, also facilitated through base search, as I understand, which made, in, made it possible to discover research, not only that's, that, that's not limited to English. Um, so how do, you, how, how do you work with open knowledge maps around these issues? Yeah, thanks. Uh, absolutely. I think for us, diversity and inclusiveness is really key. And we really try to follow through on this, right? So, and um, early on, we started a community program where people around the world would bring the feedback to us from their communities, right? And we made sure that this really um, represents the wider community and all the continents and so on. And uh, yeah, it, it brought a lot of interesting insights for us and language diversity was one of them, which was initially not as much on our radar, right? But as soon as we got the feedback that this is needed, um, we started looking into it and um, it's difficult, uh, but we, we definitely want to, to give our best on this, right? Um, and I remember the conversation that I had with African colleagues um, around this also very early on, whether they would rather like to have their own open knowledge maps, the African open knowledge maps, or whether it's more important for them to be adequately represented within a global open knowledge maps. And I think the conclusion was that they would like to have both options, right? They want to be adequately represented, but they also want to have the option to take the infrastructure and adapt it to their context. Um, and that was a very interesting insight for me and also, yeah, something uh, that we, we keep with us. And of course, that's also possible with an open source software, but then it also needs to be easily um, set up, right? So that's something where we still are uh, some way um, far from that, um, but, but we definitely work towards that. Um, I think my, my major question around this is how can we get funders and organizations who are usually very regional, right? And there's a huge bias in funding uh, a regional 
biased. Um, how can we get them to really recognize this work? Because it's hard work. Um, it takes much more time to do it this way. Uh, it's definitely worth it. I wouldn't want to do it any other way. But it seems when it comes to evaluating a proposal or an infrastructure, then suddenly it's more about, you know, well, what's the exciting technical development or technical thing or what can you do for us, right, as, as an organization. And mm -hmm. then this work really does not seem to, to count for very much. Um, and that's what, yeah, would be also, I mean, I don't know if any funders are in the room, but I asked this question, I think, uh, yesterday or two days ago, how if there are any plans of funders to make infrastructure funding more um, equitable and inclusive. Um, and I really would like to see a discussion around that. Yeah, thanks very much. And we mentioned language um, as an issue, a challenge. And it's it doesn't like it starts with infra, uh, in the interface to have an interface that's not only readable and comprehensible for English speakers, if it's your first or second language, because we have Franco from Africa is basically a quarter of the continent. We have an Arabic speaking community on the continent. We have a huge community that speaks also um, Portuguese and then all these Af like African languages, obviously. Um, when assuming that English must be functional for everyone, I mean, of course, is a necessary step. And as you rightly said, I mean, it would be good if every funder would just put like, half of the money goes into diversity, making a diversity a reality. Um, so of course have the United Nations languages covered. So every tool has six languages as a default. That would be a good starting point. And we're far from that. But anyways, yeah, let's, let's close on a positive note. <laughs> Thank you everyone for, for staying in. I think, yeah, many of these issues have been raised in different um, rooms as well. Um, let's continue the conversation. And I think many of us are already working on one or the other aspects and many of these.